Good morning. Happy Independence Day weekend. We're glad that you're here. You're an encouragement to me and all those around you. And we thank you for making the choice to come and worship our Heavenly Father this morning. So that's wonderful that uh, we've all done that and have gathered this morning to remember to praise our Father for all the good that he's done for us. We do have some visitors with us this morning, and you're our honored guests. And so thank you. We have Cole's family visiting, and I know he's excited about that. And uh, uh, unfortunately, they brought hot weather with them. So, so we'll just have to accept that. But thank you for being here. And I know you're, you're in a, it's an encouragement to see Cole's presence here every Sunday. And we really appreciate that. That speaks highly of him. And we know that wherever he's assigned in the future, he'll be an encouragement to the church. So that's wonderful. So we, uh, we do have a couple of things that are listed in the bulletin. If you haven't picked up a bulletin, please do so. Always good information in there, especially prayer requests. Uh, let's look at those and other announcements. It's great to have Debbie back from her mission trip. She said there were 17 baptisms there during her stay and that's a wonderful thing to praise god for i know there's much rejoicing over that we also have a special announcement uh, those of you that uh know uh lance uh, went down to brazil and came back with a bride and a new son so Daisy is here with us this morning, and so we're very excited to have her with us uh, with her son, Arthur. And so we want to welcome them, and we are so happy uh, that uh, she, has, she has come all the way. They had a trip all the way from Brazil starting on Thursday, Friday, finally got here yesterday, uh, and that's with no delays and no cancellations, so <laughs> quite a trip. But we're glad to have them, and we want to welcome them. Let's talk, take a songbook, and we'll sing a couple of songs here. We'll sing two songs, and then uh, Q will lead us in prayer. We'll start out with number 230, 230. Worthy of praise is Christ our Redeemer, worthy of glory, honor, and power, worthy of all our soul's adoration, worthy art thou, worthy art thou, worthy of riches, blessings, and honor, worthy of wisdom, glory, and power, worthy of earth and heaven's thanksgiving worthy art thou worthy art thou lift up the voice in praise and devotion saints of all earth before him should bow angels in heaven worship him saying worthy art thou worthy art thou Worthy of riches, blessings, and honor. Worthy of wisdom, glory, and power. Worthy of earth and heaven's thanksgiving. Worthy art thou, worthy art thou. Lord, may we come before thee with singing, filled with thy spirit, wisdom, and power. May we ascribe thee glory and honor. Worthy art thou, worthy art thou. Worthy of riches, blessings, and honor. Worthy of wisdom, glory, and power. Worthy of earth and heaven's thanksgiving. Worthy art thou. Worthy Let's sing number 18. Number 18, Faithful Love. <clears throat> faithful Love. 
Faithful love flowing down from the thorn-covered crown Makes me whole, saves my soul, washes whiter than snow Faithful love calms each fear, reaches down, dries each tear Holds my hand when I can't stand on my own to face and Jesus is his name faithful love is a friend when when hope seems to end welcome face sweet embrace tender touch filled with grace faithful love endless power living flames spirit's fire Burning bright in the night, guiding my way. Faithful love from above came to earth to show the Father's love. And I'll never be the same. Thank you, Twain. Would you bow it, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day. Another day that we can praise your name. Another day that we have opportunities to share your love and your message with those around us. Father, thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. And as we prepare to celebrate our Independence Day, we pray for the safety of everyone. Father, we, we understand your word and we we strive to obey, and there's times that we fail, and we pray for forgiveness, and we pray for strength. Help us to encourage each other, and always be mindful of the tremendous sacrifice that Jesus made so that we may have the opportunity of eternal life with you. Father, we pray that you will be with the members of our military that are serving around the world, away from their families. Pray for their families that are home, anxiously waiting for their return. Father, we pray that everything that we do here today is pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' precious name, amen. preparation for the communion let's sing number 200 or let's sing two songs not 200 songs but two two songs will be just fine we'll begin by singing number 768 768 Jesus, let us come to know you, let us see you face to face, touch us, oh. 
Mold us, use us, mold us, only let us live in you. Jesus, draw us ever nearer, hold us in your loving arms, wrap us in your gentle presence, when being comes, bring us home. Now number 320, 320. Here with the cross my heart can say, I am coming nearer. Nearer the cross from day to day, I am coming nearer. Nearer the cross where Jesus died, nearer the fountain's crimson tide, Nearer my Savior's wounded side, I am coming nearer, I am coming nearer. Nearer the Christian's mercy see, I am coming nearer, feasting my soul on manna sweet, I am coming nearer, stronger in faith, more clear I see, Jesus who gave himself for me, nearer to him I still would be, still I'm coming nearer, still I'm coming Aspires. I am coming nearer, deeper the love my soul desires. I am coming nearer, nearer the end of toil and care, nearer the joy I long to share, nearer the cross I soon shall wear. I am coming nearer, I am coming nearer. I've been blessed to uh, have been able to uh, we go to Israel four times, and uh, I don't know how things are now, you know, but when I was there, I can assure you that between four between six o'clock Friday night and six o'clock Saturday night, there was really nothing open. And the reason I'm bringing that up is I just wanted to put in perspective what I'm about to read here regarding Jesus' family and the devotion of the uh, the, the true Jewish people. Uh, like I said, I don't know how it is now, you know. Of course, the jets were always flying over there to bomb Palestinians, but uh, other than that, you know, you didn't see too much. You know. But anyway, I'm about to read this. Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, were devout <clears throat> Jews, and they raised Jesus in according to the teachings and rituals of the Jewish religion. And this is evident in Luke 2.21, where Luke writes, on the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. And verse 22 reads, When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. 
Because he was brought up observing the law of Moses, Jesus had celebrated the Passover festival and had taken part in the Passover meal along with all the rituals required by the law. The first Lord's Supper took place during one of these Passover meals where Jesus ate with the disciples. However, Jesus, knowing that his time was near, added a new meaning to the sacred ritual. The Lord's Supper uses bread to symbolize the body of Jesus and wine to represent his blood. As we partake it, the purpose is for us to remember his sacrifice on the cross, examine ourselves, most important, confess our sins, and proclaim him as Lord and Savior. As we take the bread that represents his body broken for us, we remember and celebrate his faithfulness to us and to all who will receive him. We cannot begin to fathom the agonizing suffering of his crucifixion, yet he took that pain for us. He died for us. We thank him for his extravagant love and unmerited favor. We thank him because his sacrifice has given us life, an abundant life now, and an eternal life forever. As he instructed his disciples, we are to do this in remembrance of him. And in the same way, we take this fruit of the vine that represents the blood poured out from a splinter cross. We realize that he was the supreme sacrifice for all our sins, past, present, and future. Because of his blood shed for us and his body broken for us, we can be free from the power and penalty of sin. We thank him for his victory over death. We took the punishment and death that we deserve. His pain was indeed our gain. And today we remember and celebrate the precious gift of life he gave us throughout the blood that he spilled. Each time we partake the Lord's Supper, we are to commit, recommit ourselves, our lives, our hearts, our thoughts, everything to him. Will you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread that represents the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father. And may all of us who take it, Father, do so, Father, in a pleasing manner toward you, Father. We ask all this, Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the same manner, Father, we ask you, Father, to bless this fruit of the vine, Father, that represents the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father, that was spilled on the cross, Father. And again, Father, may all of us who take it, Father, do so, Father, in a manner that will be pleasing to you. We ask all this, Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. In the back, there's a box back there where the elders have found it convenient for us to deposit whatever contributions we want to contribute today. You bow with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the many blessings you have bestowed upon us, Father, for our health, for our freedom, especially on this weekend of the 4th of July, Father, which allows us, thanks to you, Father, the ability for us to be here today, Father, and worship you and praise you, Father. We ask you, Father, that this contribution or this money that is collected today, Father, will be utilized by our leadership, Father, to further your cause, further your teachings, Father. We ask all this, Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please turn to in Mark number 934. Softly and tenderly, we'll follow the lesson this morning. 934. Once you have that, Mark, let's sing number 608. 608. And if you are able, stand with me, please. Let's sing out.
He took my burdens all away up to a brighter day. He gave me a song, a wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing. In my heart joy bells ring. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me. And out. Oh, praise his name. He is my king. A wonderful song. He is to me. Brighter the way grows every day. Walking the heavenly way he gave me a song. A wonderful song. A wonderful song I now can sing. Praise to him, my king. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. He is my king. A wonderful song he is to me. I am redeemed no more to die, never to say goodbye. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. And some of these days in that fair land, sing with a chorus grand. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. He is my king. A wonderful song he is to me, he is to me. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Dwayne, for leading us in that wonderful singing. Our lesson this morning is, uh, it's about singing in a very indirect fashion. So if you'll take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 35. This passage came to my attention about a month ago the 35th chapter of Isaiah. And it came to my attention because in the Wednesday night class where we're studying the life of Christ, we're in the scenes in Matthew 11 and Luke chapter 7 where John the Baptist has sent two of his disciples to question Jesus to be sure that uh, he is the Messiah. And Jesus answers there and says to him, basically, go tell John what you've seen and what you heard. And in the Wednesday night class, we've been stressing the fact that Jesus is trying to teach the fact that our faith in him comes from the evidence. And in that uh, passage, Jesus says, you, you see that the... Uh, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the blind see. And these were all things that were very specifically prophesied that the Messiah would do. So he doesn't say, in other words, in response to the question, are you the Messiah? He didn't say, yes, I am. He basically says, what does the evidence say? Who does the evidence say that I am? And the path to salvation is, of course, Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no exceptions. No one comes to the Father except through me. So as I got to studying that passage, in Isaiah 35, I did what I always do and 
and read the whole chapter to make sure I'm, I'm getting the context correct and everything. And as I did that, I realized just what a great chapter Isaiah 35 is. It, it's only 10 verses, but it communicates so much. And so I told the class, I said, well, we're going to reference that section of 35 now and, and see where it talks about what the Messiah will do. But I said, we're going to have a, little, a lesson in worship uh, one Sunday soon uh, and study the chapter as a whole. One of the things that I try to be careful of as a preacher is that when I choose the subject, for different lessons. I am speaking enough about the confidence that we have in Christ. And if you don't have that confidence, or maybe uh, at the end of the lesson you feel like you don't have it the way that you should, you need to immediately Take that to the Lord. You need to immediately ask his help in having the confidence in Christ that you're supposed to have. And this prophecy in Isaiah 35 is such a tremendous picture of what it's like to come to Jesus and then to live that life of a disciple so that we can be in heaven in the presence of God, in the presence of Jesus, in the presence of the Holy Spirit and have a joy unmatched by anything on earth. And it's a hard struggle for preachers in general and for me as well to put that balance in our teaching because, of course, what you want to do is correct the things you see that need improvement. And so you have a tendency to have sermons that are always basically the thought that... Uh, I, we're bad people. And so I've always tried to avoid that and keep that balance. And several weeks back now, I just haven't had the right slot to put this lesson in yet. But several weeks back, I thought to myself, you know, I haven't preached a really good sermon on confidence since that I did that one a year and a half ago or so. Uh, uh, the one that was called We Are the Champions. And if you're struggling with uh, these things that we talk about this morning, there's nothing wrong with going to the website and finding that lesson and listening to that one as well. That one talks a little bit more uh, specifically about the confidence while we're going to see it this morning in light of the overall picture of Isaiah 35. Now, one thing that happens when you go to these prophecies is prophecies usually have, I like the term, a dual fulfillment. Some people talk about the immediate fulfillment versus the distant uh, fulfillment. It's just different ways of trying to, to say that a, a prophecy usually had some immediate application, and it also had an application uh, basically in the Christian era. And when you come to Isaiah, what you see again and again is that the physical nation of Israel and the transgressions that they made against God and the promises that God had made to them 
and continue to make to them are usually the immediate focus of a lot of the things you'll read in a book like Isaiah. When you get to chapter 35, it's very interesting because you can tie it to the physical nation of Israel, and you should, but the much greater fulfillment is the fulfillment in the coming of the Messiah. So I hope this morning as we go through, I hope to, uh, to show you some things to build your confidence and your discipleship. Because it was great to hear that last song and the joy that we sang it with. That should be a shadow of the joy that we have all the time, and especially in the worship service, in the corporate assembly on the first day of the week. As we recognize who we are because of who he is. So I'm going to read all 10 verses, and then I'll come and break some things down for us to help us build our confidence and to help us also see a little bit about things that have to be avoided to have our joy. So Isaiah 35 begins, the wilderness and the desert will be glad and the Arabi will rejoice and blossom like the crocus it will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. Now, if you really wanted to emphasize joy, could you come up with more than rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy? So we are talking about tremendous joy here. It's the glory of Lebanon that will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. These are all place references that they knew that represented beautiful places, beautiful cities, etc. So they will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. And then verse 3 says, Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, Take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then, and this is where you see the immediate tie-in to Matthew 11 and Luke 7, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. For waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. The scorched land will become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. And the haunt of jackals, its resting place, grass becomes reeds and rushes. And then verse 8 is one I've shared with you before. A highway will be there, a roadway. And it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way. And fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there. But the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion. With everlasting joy upon their heads, they will find gladness and sorrow, and sorrow and sighing, uh, gladness, they will find gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. So, this is written, of course, the physical nation of Israel is in exile. They're in Babylon and the assorted lands where they've been scattered to. And so the very easy way to look at this chapter, but very much the wrong way, is to say it's talking about the return of physical Israel going through the physical desert 
to get back to the promised land and especially to Jerusalem slash Zion. And of course, Zion is representative of the heavenly sphere. I decided recently I was going to start using the term heavenly sphere more, Eddie, because but more and more as I study the eschatology, these things beyond this life, I, I realize how pitiful our knowledge of it is and how uh, incomplete it is because of our own weaknesses. But rather than uh, debating over when and where heaven will be, etc., let's just think of the heavenly sphere, the heavenly home, where God is with his people. And so you can hear, as I re read through that, that it is definitely about a journey for God's people on a highway, on a road, and it is definitely going from somewhere to Zion. But the desert is not that physical desert. The desert is the cause, the reason why they're in Babylon and those assorted lands. It's their sinful nature, their constant rebellion against God. That is pictured as the desert. Life's hard in the desert. I was burning up when I walked outside for a few minutes yesterday. I looked at my phone and it said it was 92. About 11 o'clock in the morning. I said, 92. First day of July. I don't know what we're going to get this summer, family. But I know where it's worse. It's worse in the desert. I don't want to go to Death Valley. You know, I never understood why people want to go to a place called Death Valley. Yeah. Name kind of puts you off, doesn't it? Life is hard in the desert. And it's pictured, if you remember, as the home of jackals. You know, jackals were, of course, despised in that, uh, looked upon as a low form of scavenger. Now, that's what the desert is filled with. But a change can come to the people of God. To the people who really come to the highway. So when it talks in, in verses 1 and 2 there about the rejoicing that will come basically from this transformation. It pictures a desert that suddenly burst out. And suddenly it's not all only that it's it's native plants if you will are, are are growing and showing their flowers like we know happens in the deserts after a, a rainfall it's about basically every nice beautiful thing he can imagine trying to tie that concept up in a nutshell that's what comes forth in the desert when you find the highway of holy. And isn't it interesting that again and again, the imagery contrasted with the desert is what? It's water. It's water. I asked a, a youth group one time when they were struggling with the concept, I was trying to help them get I said, why were old cities always built by a river or a spring or something like that, you know? And they were able to get that, and they said, well, because they had to have an immediate water source. We know that water brings life. And that's not the accidental coincidence uh, of uh, atoms coming together uh, and, and forming different chemicals and everything. That's the design of God. 
who designed this world to teach us about him. And in the design of God, the strongest imagery for life is water for eternal life. Jesus, John chapter 4, talking to, to the Samaritan woman. That's John chapter 9. You know. I'm lost. It's in the book of John. Read that. It's one of my favorites. Um, but Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman there talks about himself as the living water. And that imagery is used repeatedly for him. So what is really transforming the desert is what? It's Jesus. The highway of holiness is not just but living the life of discipleship. That's one of my biggest criticisms of a lot of interpretations here that make the highway of holy just strictly your, your, your discipleship. That's true. It is your discipleship. But the deeper concept and the more joyful concept is that the highway itself is Jesus. Just like the water transforming the desert. When someone has fallen in sin and they get deeper and deeper, you will frequently see their lives just become completely barren. And I've talked with those people and they complain and they say, you know, basically, I'm not happy. Even if they have a lot of material things, they um, basically, I'm not happy. They've made their life that desert by their choice. The tie-in with the physical nation is that they made their scattering, their exile, it was all of their own doing. It was not what God wanted for his people, not remotely. It was what they earned because of the justice of God. Look at verse 4 for a second. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Now, I read several commentators uh, in the past month, because I've been studying it off and on for a month. I read several commentators who talked about how, behold, your God will come with vengeance. Shouldn't be there. They don't make that judgment based on any textual reason. They make that judgment, and it just shows you the state of some people's Bible scholarship. They make that judgment based on the fact that the thought of God's vengeance doesn't fit in with a chapter that is clearly all about joy. But doesn't it? In order for there to be joy, there has to be peace with God. And peace with God is a result of righteousness. And if there is no judgment, there is no righteousness. I want you to think about that one for a minute. I put it in my notes. Everybody think about it for a minute. The scriptures tell us that righteousness is the foundation of his throne. It also says that judgment is the foundation of his throne. 
you can't separate the two. You can't have one without the other, you see. Justice is what we're really talking about. And justice is a foundation of his throne. All of, all of these are qualities of God. Characteristics are aspects of God. And so, if you're not on the highway of holiness, guess what? I believe for some of us, Jeff, of the right generation, ACDC has a song. Yeah, Highway to Hell. If you're not on the highway of holiness, guess what? You can sing that song. And your, your dwelling place. And see, here I'm going to talk, the, talk about the, the spear of hell. See, I've changed my terminology on both. We don't know what hell will be like in the details. Just like we don't really know what heaven will be like in the details. But we know it will be a place of torment given to those who aren't on the highway of holiness, who aren't in the highway of holiness. I thought about the fact that one way you could picture this is like you've got the river, the water, springing forth, you'll notice, and coming out across the desert and transforming it. But underneath it, it's like the river is riding a bridge. And that bridge or that river takes you safely through the time of your discipleship. The highway of heaven only goes one place. So does the other one. And it is blasphemous because it is speaking against God and his word to say that there is no hell, there is no place of torment, or that those who aren't with God for eternity are in that place. His images make that very clear. So if you're in that river, then that's your individual discipleship, and you're going where? To Zion. I tried to get Twain to lead an invitation song for me, and he refused on the weak excuse that I told him five minutes before Bible class, and he doesn't know the song. So, yeah. But I wanted us to sing, We're Coming to See the Kings. You know that song, Soon and, soon and Very Soon, We Are Going to See the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. That is is us or should be us now and so while the desert's a problem we don't really have to worry about it if we just do one thing stay on the bridge stay in the river and you'll just pass it by i've been trying for some time and i i know you can look it up on the websites i just haven't I have other things I would prefer to research than this, but I have wondered, for those of you who have been down 98 through Gulf Breeze lately, what in the world we are doing there. They have totally turned that highway up. They have built a new pond, uh, working on the drainage. And I thought that they were just putting in new drains. I was hoping they were widening 98 through there. Uh, it's funny, we got a bridge, three lanes that immediately turns into two lanes and doesn't make a lot of sense to me at least. But last, this past week, they started driving pylons 
down the side of the road at a distance of a little more than a lane width. Yeah. And I thought, well, I had no idea what they're doing here. But it made me remember that a few years back, when they were brainstorming what to do about the traffic jam that is 98 going through us and on down to Fort Walton, Destin, etc. And they talked about building uh, a highway that would be above 98. And that idea got shot down. And I saw those pylons this past week. I thought, maybe they're, they're going back to that idea so that through traffic can be up here and local traffic can be down here. I doubt it. It makes too much sense. Uh, but that's what Jesus does for us. He is with us on that road, on that highway of holiness. Think about John 15. We should, we should do that one soon. John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. And what's the stress on? You have to abide in me. So you come to the highway of holiness, you get on it, and your life is transformed. It's not transformed necessarily in that all of a sudden you're going to be healthy and wealthy because the purpose of the highway is one thing. It's to get to Zion. It's to get to the heavenly sphere. It doesn't go anywhere else. It, it, it's a road that goes to heaven, to the presence of God. When Zion is used, it's always trying to stress not just heaven, but in particular, the presence of God, the dwelling place of God. Jerusalem is often symbolized with Zion. Jerusalem's name means uh, well, I mean, city of peace now, but the original name meant the city of the king. Yeah. And, and that was a way of referring to it among the Hebrews, the city of the king. Yeah. That's why, metaphorically, it's God's city, God's presence that's identified. I wish I had time to give a sermon on the introduction <laughs> to that highway. But I'll just show you a couple of quick passages. Okay. Let's go to Romans 10, verses 10. That's a passage I hear all the time. From those who say that one doesn't need to be baptized as part of the plan of salvation, that that's an, that's an option. And so they will give you Romans 10.10. 10. And yet it seems like the same thing we see so many times. It seems like they're really not reading the verse. <laughs> so if you go to Romans 10, you'll see, for example, uh, up in verse 8, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are uh, preaching. So he's talking about belief in uh, the, the gospel message and belief in it. Then he says in verse 9 and 10 that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Now, if you look just at those two verses, 9 and 10, and you're doing a casual reading, I can see that presentation. And again, I know a lot of the English Bibles translate it differently. I'm reading from New American Standard 95 edition. 
The old King James said, unto salvation. Uh, which, of course, I actually like better because even today we still understand the thought that's there in the Greek is not that you obtain salvation by believing or that you obtain salvation by confessing, but that you are introducing yourself to it. You're on, you're on the way to it. Think of a traveler in that desert. Think of a traveler in that desert. What's the number one thing? We see it in all these movies. The number one thing those people going through the desert are looking for. They're trying to find some water because there's no life without water. And so hearing and believing and confessing, having faith, they all bring you to the water. But the language of Scripture, even though now, like I said, some of these versions, they're trying to obscure it, the language of Scripture is clear. That doesn't grant the salvation. That's part of the journey. That, that's necessary to find the river, if you will. But you're still not in the river, and that's why the old King James used until in all these places. Yeah. I like the New American Standard in verse 10 there where it uses the, the word resulting in. So it gives you the, the idea just as well as until, or at least to me, that it's something not accomplished yet. Yeah. And then we can go to any number of passages, but since we're in Romans, let's go to Romans 6. And he talks in verse 10 and, 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 and verse 3 and says, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Therefore, because that is the truth, amen, that is the truth. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. We talked in Bible class this morning about how that symbolism is clearly the, the uh, burial, the immersion, the submerging of the individual. We've been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. You come to the river. If you are then a believing, penitent sinner, you can then go into the river. Naaman didn't lose his leprosy on the bank, did he? Now, you go down into the water, Acts chapter 8, you come up out of the water, and then you're on the highway of holiness. And when you're on the highway of holiness, you are to keep your, your attention on the destination. It's all about the destination. Zion, the presence of God. That highway is surrounded by a desert. If I take an exit, guess where I'm going? Back to the desert. What did that symbolize? Where's that highway going to lead me? The abundant life is in the water because the water is Jesus, and it's in Jesus. And because of that, you have verses here in Isaiah 35. You have verses like, but he will save you. And then this is where that prophecy actually comes into play. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout, shout for joy. That's the happiness. And as it goes on and it describes that, that the highway of holiness, no unclean will travel on it. It will be for him who walks that way. Fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there. If those things aren't on the highway, what is the significance to me? If I'm in the highway, do I, should I be worried about the lion? No. Lions, if I take one of those exits, because I saw a flashy billboard. You're starting to get Isaiah's picture there. 
and, and a detour. And as a result, I may never get back into the river. I may never get back into the river. I thought when I was writing this lesson about all those trips I've told you I've made to Arkansas all my life every year, as a boy going at least twice a year and as an adult going, going once a year for the most part, on occasion, twice, on occasion, miss. But when I was younger, I got in that car, and guess when I wanted to stop? I wanted to stop when I was at the farm. Because the farm is the closest thing on earth to me. That farm and my family and that Dayton congregation of lords, that, that's the closest thing to heaven to me. And when I get in that car, I don't want to stop. When I was younger, I, I wouldn't stop until I was on fumes. Yeah. Now I have to stop very often so I can get all the snap popping going on and, and then get back in and go a little further. Do you have somewhere like that in your life? Ed, I don't know if Michigan's like that for you. I mean, you, everyone go back to Italy? Well, you've done that, haven't you? See? Most of us have some place like that. That is the way you should think about Zion. That is the way you should. And you see, that way was not available in Zion, Isaiah's day. That's why you can't make an immediate fulfillment of the, the uh, passage as a whole. In fact, it tells you when that river was going to spring up in the prophecy. Look at it again. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The, re the recompense of God will come. That's for those who didn't take the highway. But he will save you. See? So there's judgment in that one verse. Just the last half of verse 4. There is vengeance and salvation. Then, what word was that? Then, that means at that time, right? And then what then means? If Debbie asked me to do something during football season, she knows what she's going to get an answer. I am watching the game, then I will do that. What does that mean? That, <laughs> that means not now, but it does tell when. Yeah. She complains because they have so much TV, football on TV these days, see. In, in the earlier days, you, wouldn't, you couldn't watch that many games. But now, if you never want to move, <laughs> get your DVR, your NFL network, go to work. Yeah. Then, when was the then? Jesus himself tells us in Matthew 11, in Luke chapter 7, also, in an earlier passage, where he reads from there in the synagogue and then says, Today, this has been fulfilled in your presence. The prophecies of a river that would take the people of God safely through the desert and that would be free from all harm, that process did, could not begin since Jesus is the water until Jesus came. He had to live that perfect life and be that perfect sacrifice. So there would be a perfect life for us to get in so that we're judged on him and not us. I know that's a lot this morning. I wish we could do the rest of it. But that's why I read it all to start with. So you can see the flow that is in there. Maybe you're here this morning, you've, you, you, you've taken steps toward the river, but you've never taken the plunge. Could there be anything more important than doing that? Maybe, maybe you're a disciple and your walk has lost its joy. Please understand, if your walk loses your joy, 
You have forgotten to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And you can take it to God right now and make it right. If you need to come, please do so as we stand and sing. And watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling home. Tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me. Why should we linger and heed not his mercies? Mercies for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are we. Tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh, sinner, come home. Oh, for the wonderful love he had promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon. Pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling home. those comments and uh, thank you for being here and worshiping with us this morning we hope you'll have a cool rest of the day <laughs> let's sing one verse of 524 and then dennis will lead us in our closing prayer first verse 524 I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Recently we've talked about predestination and free will, and I'm assured that we do not believe in predestination or many of us would not be here. You see me at my best when I'm around you. I have trouble with my thoughts, what I say and what I do when I'm around other people and when I'm alone. 
I have nobody to blame. No outside forces make me do this thing. Well, maybe Satan, he's there always waiting. The road to heaven to me, I think, is like climbing tall stairs or going uphill a lot of times. I can easily glide down to hell. So let us pray. Lord, I ask you forgiveness of what I do, what I think, and what I feel sometimes. I know it is not Christ-like at all, and I ask you forgiveness. I know I'm not the only one in this situation because you tell us that all have sinned. Forgive us, Lord. Be with us in everything we do. Be with those that protect this nation. Be with all of those that are traveled. Be with our new family that is amongst us and be with our visitors. Again, Lord, forgive us of our sins. For us in Christ's sake, amen.